Good morning. Good morning. I like the sound of that. And happy Mother's Day, uh, all of you mothers and grandmothers. Uh, what a joy it is to celebrate the day with you. If you would please give attention to the back of your order of worship. Very short and to the point today. Wednesday evening Bible study and Thursday theology pub. Details there and details to follow as well. One note for you so that you're not alarmed and think that we uh, maybe have passed over you. Elder Capone and I will be serving the elements today. We'll also be doing the tithes and offerings. And the way this will go, there's just two of us serving today, is we will start in the middle and take care of everyone at the ends of the aisle, and then we'll come back and circle to the outside and take care of those of you on the outside so we're not uh, passing, passing trays between families down the aisles. So uh, I think that's it. Any other announcements, Pastor? All right, let's prepare our hearts and uh, ready ourselves to worship the one true God. It is my privilege to call you into, the, into worship to the one true God. I invite you to stand and to lift your voices. Let us worship God. We are gathered in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Let us give thanks to the Lord. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord be with you. This is the day that the Lord has made. We confess that Jesus is the resurrection and the life. But if it dies, it produces much grain. He is risen. Lift up your hearts. Join me in prayer. Almighty God, from whom all good things do come, encourage us to preserve the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Enable us to think on those things that are good, and by your merciful guiding, enable us to perform the same. And may we do all of this for the glory of your name, the health of the church, and through our Lord Jesus Christ, who also taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Let's join together re reading the first psalm. We'll do so to prepare ourselves to confess our sins, even as we receive our Lord's instruction. Let's read together. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind blows away. Therefore, the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. This is God's word, and all of God's people said. Amen. Our Lord provides a non-withering fruitfulness for us. Our Lord calls his children to a certain avoidance, stay away from these things, and to a daily practice. We are to avoid the counsel and the path and the seats of evil, and we are to delight in the righteous word of the Lord, meditating in it day and night. This shapes us, this changes us, and this also reminds us to confess our sins. So if you are able at this time, we'll kneel together and we'll pray together. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, grant us your mercy as we confess our sins to you. We have not loved you or your ways as we are. Our interests have not been shaped by your pleasures as they ought. We have sought our own ways. We have resisted and, at times, refused good counsel. We need you to cleanse us from the sin of our deeds, our speech, as well as those of our thoughts and intentions. By your Holy Spirit, enable us to pursue your holiness, without which no one will see you. Renew us and give us joy in your ways. In your kindness, pardon the sins we now confess to you. Let us conclude in prayer. O oh Lord, we give you thanks for your kindness and abundant pardon provided through your Son who has died for us, taking the penalty which was our due, and you have received us in him. Now grant, most merciful Lord, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life, and this to the glory of thy holy name. Amen. I invite you to stand and to receive the good news. For God, our Heavenly Father, has had mercy upon us in Christ Jesus, and we who have confessed our sins, being found in Jesus Christ, are a forgiven people. Receive now these words from 1 John chapter 2. My little children, I am writing these things to you that you may not sin, and if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. We have a righteous mediator, a righteous advocate, a righteous defender on our behalf, Jesus Christ the Righteous One. We are found in Him, and therefore we have the full forgiveness of sins, and I declare this to you in the name of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit.
Amen. You may be seated. This morning, brothers and sisters, our call to prayer as well as much of the prayers of the church are influenced by Psalm 9. I'm sure you'll recognize some of the language. So our call to prayer is from the first two verses of that psalm. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. I will recount all of your wonderful deeds. I will be glad and exult in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. So let us pray. Our Father in heaven, this morning we enter into your presence with thanksgiving and we lift our hearts of gratitude to you. For you have not dealt with your people according to their sins, but according to your loving kindness. By the blood and righteousness of Jesus Christ, you have redeemed a people unto yourself. We are glad, and we exult in you, and not in our own works or unworthiness. For you are the Lord, and sit enthroned forever. You have established your throne for justice, and you judge the world with righteousness, and your people with uprightness. As we consider the various trials of our present day, we note the words of the psalmist and ask you to be gracious to us, O Lord. See our affliction and lift us up that we may recount your praises. Indeed, the nations have sunk in the pit that they made. In the net that they laid, their own foot has been caught. But you, Lord, have made yourself known. You have executed judgment. The wicked are snared in the work of their own hands. Father, we ask for your mighty spirit to move in your church throughout this land state, city, and in this congregation to bring repentance and renewed faith leading to greater obedience and joyful service. In your judgment, bring repentance that those whom you've chosen would turn from their sin and to Jesus Christ. Let the nations know that they are but men. Our Father, we bring this congregation before you and ask for help in setting our minds on you and not on the things of man to deny ourselves, to take up our cross and follow you. Make us to abhor that which grieves your Holy Spirit, to shun a careless way of life, to be gentle and patient towards all men, and to not only be a professor, but an example of the gospel. Father, help us to display in every relation, calling, or condition into which you have led us the excellency, the loveliness, and the advantages of knowing Jesus. In our various trials, Work in us the obedience of faith so that when the Son of Man comes on that last day with his angels and in the glory of his Father to repay each person according to what he has done, that we would be found faithful and true. Our Father, today we remember those in our congregation who have lost employment, who have reduced income. According to your will, provide new ways and places for them to labor and then bless the work of their hands that they would be well provided. For those who labor in health care or as first responders, preserve and strengthen them that their testimony for Christ Jesus would bring glory and honor to, you, to your holy name. Our Father, we pray for our brother Nathan Husted. Be pleased, O Lord, to guard his heart from the influence of the world and the flesh. Let his faith be a shield against the fiery darts of the enemy. Preserve and protect him and help him to find favor in the eyes of his fellow Marines and commanding officers. Father, we pray for Shonda Parker, the mother of our dear sister Emily. Be gracious, gracious to Shonda that her present discomfort would be alleviated, that her new situation in hospice would be a blessing, and that her faith and ours would be strengthened by the difficult providence that you have brought to her. And now, Father, privately in our own hearts, we lift those dear to us and in need of your saving, preserving, and providing power. Finally, this morning, our Father, we ask for your blessing on the ministries of Pastors Neil and Jeffrey. Bind them in a heart of unity and vision and keep them from discouragement. Cause their ministry to proceed with power that we would be built up in our faith, brought to repentance from our sin and encouraged in each week of labor, thus advancing your kingdom. Thank you for hearing our prayers, O Lord. Now to him who is able to strengthen us according to the gospel of Jesus Christ. To the only wise God be glory forevermore. 
In the matchless name of Jesus, we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. So our lesson from the Old Testament today is from Proverbs chapter 3, verses 13 through 26. Give ear to the reading of the word of the Lord. Blessed is the one who finds wisdom and the one who gets understanding. For the gain from her is better than gain from silver, and her profit better than gold. She is more precious than jewels, and nothing you desire can compare with her. Long life is in her right hand, in her left hand are riches and honor. Her ways are ways of pleasantness, and all her paths are peace. She is a tree of life to those who lay hold of her. Those who hold her fast are called blessed. The Lord by wisdom founded the earth. By understanding, he established the heavens. By his knowledge, the deeps broke open, and the clouds dropped down the dew. My son, do not lose sight of these. Keep sound wisdom and discretion, and they will be life for your soul and adornment for your neck. Then you will walk on your way securely, and your foot will not stumble. If you lie down, you will not be afraid. When you lie down, your sleep will be sweet. Do not be afraid of sudden terror or of the ruin of the wicked when it comes, for the Lord will be your confidence and will keep your foot from being caught. And our lesson from the epistles today is Romans chapter 9, verses 14 through 29. What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I have raised you up, that I might show my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So then he has mercy on whomever he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. Will you say to me then, why does he still find fault? For who can resist his will? But who are you, O man, to answer back to God? Will what is molded say to the molder, Why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honored use and another for dishonorable use? What if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels Pardon me, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy, which he has prepared beforehand for glory, even us whom he has called, not from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles. As indeed he says in Hosea, those who were not my people, I will call my people, and her who was not beloved, I will call beloved. And in the very place where it was said to them, you are not my people, they will be called the sons of the living God. And Isaiah cries out concerning Israel, Though the number of the sons of Israel be as the sand of the sea, only a remnant of them will be saved. For the Lord will carry out his sentence upon the earth fully and without delay. And as Isaiah predicted, If the Lord of hosts had not left us offspring, we would have been like Sodom and become like Gomorrah. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. My privilege to offer our gospel reading for today from John chapter 1. I invite you to stand. This is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ from John 1, 43. The next day, Jesus purposed to go forth into Galilee, and he found Philip, and Jesus said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael. And said to him, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said to him, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and said to him, behold, an Israelite indeed in whom is no guile. Nathanael said to him, how do you know me? Jesus answered and said to him, before Philip called you, When you were under the fig tree, I saw you. 
Nathanael answered him and said, Rabbi, you are the Son of God, you are the King of Israel. Jesus answered and said to him, Because I said to you that I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You shall see greater things than these. And he said to him, Truly, truly I say to you, you shall see the heavens opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Praise, Praise be to Christ. Christ. While we remain standing, I'd like to offer our scripture lesson for the sermon. I'll be reading to you from Matthew chapter 21. Matthew chapter 21, verses 18 through 25. Please grant this a most sincere hearing, the words of our Lord. Now in the morning when Jesus returned to the city, he became hungry. And seeing a lone fig tree by the road, he came to it and found nothing on it except leaves only. And he said to it, no longer shall there be any fruit from you. And at once the fig tree withered. And seeing this, the disciples marveled, saying, How did the fig tree wither at once? And Jesus answered and said to them, Truly I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you shall not only do what was done to the fig tree, but even if you say to this mountain, Be taken up and cast into the sea, it shall happen. And all things you ask in prayer believing, you shall receive. Thus far the reading of God's word and all of God's people said. Please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your clear word. We thank you for the comfort that is found in your word as well as the severe words, the warnings. In both the comfort and in the warnings, we are encouraged to turn to you. So by your Holy Spirit, bore out our ears, open our eyes, and enliven us to turn to Jesus Christ to follow him in all faith and faithfulness. Teach us now from your word. Spirit of God, be present among us. We pray this through Jesus our Lord, and amen. You may be seated. That fig tree and this mountain that fig tree will be withered, cursed, so that it will never produce anything again. This mountain will be cast into the sea. There are significant catastrophic changes on the horizon, and it's almost as if, reading Matthew's Gospel, we can hear the approaching hoofbeats. As we are working our way through Matthew's gospel, we keep getting the idea that something is going to happen. The tension is building. It's as if a sound which was once heard quietly, almost in the background, has been increasing in volume. We may be reminded of the soundtrack to a movie particularly a suspenseful movie where the sounds of the movie prepare us. It's not just the setting. It's not just the characters. It's what's heard. The music. The soundtrack. The score. I think of Jaws. I'm sure most of us are well aware of that deep, Repetitive, throbbing, rhythmic, building sound that tells us, the viewers, that the shark is nearby and closing in. John Williams wrote the score, the musical score for Jaws, and John Burlingame, the nation's leading writer on the subject of music for films and television, interviewed John Williams. And from that interview, John Burlingame had this. He wrote this. Rarely have six basses, eight cellos, four trombones, and a tuba held more power over listeners, especially in a movie theater. 
Burlingame went on to write, John Williams' score for Jaws ranks as some of the most terrifying music ever written for the cinema. Steven Spielberg, writing about Jaws in 1975, said, John Williams has made our movie more adventurous and gripping than I ever thought possible. It's not just the water. It's not just the boat, large or small. It's not just the shark. It was the sound, what we were hearing. There's a soundtrack. The Gospel of Matthew has a soundtrack of what's approaching. That soundtrack is what we are hearing. It's the recurring theme of approaching judgment. Soon after this very passage today, there will be many questions, discussions, debates, and parables. Each one will expose guilt, reveal fruitlessness, and declare judgment. Something's coming. Those sounds which have been in the background have now been increasing in volume and in tempo. And this has been occurring with each step closer to Jerusalem. Each step within Jerusalem and each step in the temple. Something's going to happen. In Matthew chapter 21, Jesus has come to Jerusalem. He has entered the temple. He has cleansed the temple. And then he left, not just the temple, but the city of Jerusalem for a while. Our soundtrack now will increase in volume, for Jesus is returning to the city. And he will speak to a particular tree, that tree. And he will speak of a certain mountain, this mountain. Chapter 21, verse 18, our passage opens, and it is now morning. Jesus is returning to the city of Jerusalem, and he was hungry. Verse 19, he sees a fig tree, a singular fig tree, one fig tree, a particular fig tree, that fig tree. He is looking for some figs, and he finds only leaves. So Jesus speaks to that fig tree, and he says, May no fruit come from you ever again. Finished. Ever. And the fig tree obeyed. The fig tree obeyed. The fig tree withered at once. There's no pause. There's no hesitation. Verse 20, And the disciples were amazed at once. How does this happen? The disciples are wondering. They are learning about who Jesus is. He, he speaks a word, and what he says happens. He, he did this with a demon and with the sea and now with a tree. It's as if the Creator is among us. The Creator speaks and it happens. And it's almost as if the D Creator is with us. He speaks a word of removal or un being undone, and it happens at once. The true word is present. Jesus demonstrates that what he says will happen. Hannah. Hannah's song in 1 Samuel 2, she said this, He is the one who brings low and exalts. The psalmist in Psalm 75 but God is the judge. He puts down one and he exalts another. His word is true. Our Lord from this goes on to teach and to encourage faith. Anything we attempt, anything we say is doable as long as it is in line with Jesus' word. Verse 21, Jesus says, he answers their wonderment. He says, truly I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what was done to that tree, that fig tree, but you will also say to 
this mountain, get up and be thrown into the sea. Hmm. Now, while there are lessons here about praying confidently, it's very easy to misunderstand this passage if we think that Jesus is teaching that confident, faithful praying is a matter of landscaping. Jesus is not teaching that if you just have enough confidence in your prayers, enough faith without any doubting, you can move trees and level hills. As if there might be something in our way and we have the ability to simply ask and it will move. Now, I am most thankful that our Lord did not grant many of my prayers from the past. If the Lord would have bound himself to doing whatever I ask, the world would have been messed up a long time ago. Our Lord is saying that our prayers will be powerful, they will be granted as long as they in, are in line with Jesus' word and his mission. Ask what you will and it will be done. By the way, it is what we do in and with the Lord's prayer. We are aligning ourselves with the Father's holiness, His sovereignty, His power, His will being done on earth as it is in heaven. Such prayers are world-changing. Now, this will be seen more clearly when we pay attention to the context. Take a look at the context of what's going on here. Jesus is pointing to that lone, particular, singular fig tree. Jesus is removing that which is unfruitful and is no longer needed. What are we to make of this? Now, here it's not just the soundtrack, what are we hearing? We must also pay attention to the setting, to the scene, to the location. Jesus is in Jerusalem. And the fig tree was an emblem for Israel. When Jesus called Nathanael, we heard this in our gospel reading today, he said, looking at Nathanael, behold, an Israelite indeed. You are a man of Israel. Nathanael said, how do you draw that conclusion? How do you know me? And Jesus said, I saw you under the fig tree. Well, there's something else going on here. The fig tree is an emblem for Israel, but the fig tree is also representative of Israel, especially when things are going well. King Solomon, the kingdom is united. 1 Kings chapter 4, verse 24, Solomon had dominion over everything. He had peace on all sides round about. Things are going well, and then 1 Kings 4.25 says this about the reign of Solomon. So Judah and Israel lived in safety, every man under his vine and under his fig tree, from Dan in the north to Beersheba in the south all the days of Solomon. To have a fig tree, to live under a fig tree, indicated that these were times of plenty and prosperity, and peace. To not have a fig tree meant that those things were taken away. They were gone. They were removed and misery is in its place. Jesus says to that particular fig tree, you're never going to produce fruit again. And the tree withers. The tree, it's final. The purpose, for, the purpose for which the tree was there is no longer being fulfilled. You're fruitless. You're gone. The reason that Israel was there is no longer being fulfilled. That's being moved out of the way. An end is coming. That particular fig tree near the temple in Jerusalem was going to wither away 
and die. That tree was all leafy. It might have looked good, but it was not fruitful. All right? Verse 21 also includes the reference not just to that fig tree, but also to this mountain. Again, location, location, location. This is a reference to the temple. The temple was a chief identity marker for Israel. The temple was built on a mountain. Jesus specifically says this mountain. By the way, it's called the Temple Mount. That will be removed and cast into the sea. Now, we've already seen earlier in Matthew 21 that Jesus disrupted the temple. He entered the temple and cleansed the temple because the temple was not doing what it was supposed to be doing. Jesus' cleansing of the temple was a hint of what's to come for the temple, the destruction of the temple. The temple was marked by unfaithfulness, fruitless or unfruitfulness. Outsiders were neglected. It was not a place of prayer. Remember Jesus quoted Isaiah 56? This is supposed to be a place of prayer for all nations, for all outsiders. And it's not that. It has become a den of rebels. By the way, the sea, biblically, represents the Gentiles. Israel is going to be removed. This temple is going to be removed because Jesus is the new temple and he's going to form a new temple out of all of you. And that temple is going to be going out to the Gentiles, out to the nations, out to the sea. By the way, it's interesting to note that the very first confession of Jesus as the Son of God in Matthew's Gospel after his crucifixion is by a Gentile. The centurion standing there, surely this, truly this was the Son of God. Fig tree and mountain, that tree and this mountain, tree and temple, they're all connected. They have both become fruitless. Neither is doing what they are supposed to do. They will both be removed. So, I have a question for you now to help you understand this in biblical context. When have you ever seen a withered tree in the Bible? Think about that. When have you ever seen a withered tree in the Bible? As you're thinking about that, I'd like to give you a couple of hints. The withered tree that I'm thinking of in the Bible happens to have some proximity to the sea. The, the withered tree that I'm thinking of in the Bible is in Gentile territory. It's among the nations. Where have you ever seen a withered tree in the Bible? Jonah. Did you get that right? Okay, where'd he go? Jonah was sent to Assyria, capital city of Assyria, Nineveh. Jonah knew that God was merciful to the nations. He went, and after preaching, Jonah went out of the city to watch. The Lord God was merciful to the Ninevites, and the Lord God was merciful to Jonah. The Lord God gave a plant to grow, to cover Jonah and to give him shade. Then the Lord God gave a worm to eat the plant, and it withered and died, providing what it once provided no longer. It's interesting that as we've gone through Matthew's Gospel and we've heard the soundtrack building and building and building, earlier in Matthew's Gospel, the Pharisees and the Sadducees came to Jesus and they asked for a sign from heaven. Matthew 16, and you know what Jesus said? You're marked by unbelief. You're marked by fruitlessness. And the only sign that you're going to get is the sign of the prophet Jonah. That's the sign you're going to get. 
later on in Matthew's Gospel, Jesus will actually refer to the parable of the fig tree. We are meant to see the fig tree and go, oh, 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 okay, I get it. So there's our passage today. Wanting to walk through our Lord's teaching, seeing it in biblical context. J.C. Ryle, commenting on this passage, wrote this. And presently the fig tree withered away. This is an incident almost without parallel in all of our Lord's ministry. There was a heart searching lesson in that withered fig tree. It preaches a sermon we shall all do well to hear. What is the sermon being preached in this passage? What did you hear? Oh, yes. Our Lord's words are sure words. The Lord speaks and it happens. Our Lord speaks the word of life, even death, and there is no argument. It happens. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away, and the disciples rightly marvel. Is that the lesson of the sermon preached? How about this? The Lord calls His own, places His name upon them, and calls them to faithfulness and fruitfulness. Hypocrisy is not countenanced. Leaves without fruit are no more acceptable than clouds without rain, to use the language of Jude. Our Lord said that He has chosen us so that we would be fruitful. John 15, that's why I've called you, that's why I selected you, so that you should bear much fruit and prove to be my disciples. Where is it? If not, Jesus says, He will prune, He will cut. Is that the heart-searching lesson of the fig tree? Faithlessness results in fruitlessness. Our Lord calls us to faith. Let us start there. And by the way, eventually, faithlessness becomes hardened. Fruitlessness becomes hardened. And we see throughout the Bible that what our Lord commonly does is He will give the very sin we are pursuing as the punishment for the sin. Is that the heart-searching message of the sermon? We also see that our Lord provides. The entire story of Scripture is found here. Nothing is surprising our Lord. Everything is marching according to the score, to the script, to what He has purposed. He will call and some will be unfaithful. He will expect and some will be fruitless. But He always remains faithful and fruitful. So let us conclude with this. As we focus on the Lord Jesus Christ because we are supposed to hear His word and to see His ways and we are supposed to be like those disciples who are filled with wonder and marvel that our Lord speaks and does. He is the Word, and He provides. There is something biblically significant about a withered tree of death. There's also something that we are supposed to learn about trees and fruit. We are meant to wonder. We are meant to reflect. The fig tree in our passage was fruitless and died. The one who pronounced the words upon that tree was himself going to be lifted up on a tree of death and die and bring forth much fruit. 
as those who belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us tremble at his words and take comfort in his words and trust him for his provision, for he was lifted up so that all peoples would be drawn to him. And we have been drawn to him. Let us now show forth the fruitfulness of following Christ Jesus. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we again come to you through Jesus Christ, and we praise you for our union with him. By your Holy Spirit, cause your words to sink deeply into our, into our hearing and to produce much fruit for the glory of your name. Thank you for the warnings present, for your sure word of warning, as well as your sure word of welcome. May we be found in Christ Jesus more and more, even as your Holy Spirit shapes us and crafts us into his image. We thank you and praise you for your faithfulness, and we pray this in the matchless name of Jesus our King, and amen. May the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you steadfast in the true faith, and this unto life everlasting. I declare this to you in the name of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Receive now this benediction. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. May this be true and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.